Michael Mickey Mouse. You're an interesting figure, aren't you? You've made quite the reputation for yourself since you were brought to life on the drawing board 90 years ago. You're a sensation that has swept every corner of the world, yet you're not without your band of detractors. Simply mentioning your name inspires all kinds of emotions in every man, woman, and child. You're adored by a lot of people and despised by just as many. Some are fascinated by you, while others couldn't give a fraction of a damn, with a different camp outright loathing you. It's always been that way, and I have a feeling that it's always gonna be that way. What's there to say about you that hasn't already been said? Well, I guess I can still give it a try. Again? Now that I've come so far as an animation connoisseur, I'm confident that I can do you a better justice than I did two years ago. Let's begin at the exact same starting point. A history lesson on the man behind the mouse. Walter Elias Disney, or Walt for short, actually didn't start off as the animation pioneer that he's widely known as. In fact, he had it pretty bad before his rise to fame. Poor Walt couldn't get his big break in the animation industry, meeting multiple dead ends along the harshly paved road to success. His journey began with the Newman Laphograms, an anthology of 12 theatrical cartoon shorts that ran from 1921 all the way to July of 1923. By that point, the studio behind the shorts, the eponymous Laphogram Studios in Kansas City, Missouri, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Fortunately, the Laphogram shorts have managed to survive up to the present day and have been deservedly archived across the internet. After the studio's financial failures, Walt himself decided to cut his own losses and, using the money he had earned from a very short tenure as a baby photographer and ultimately selling his movie camera, bought himself a one-way ticket to Southern California where he would live with his older brother Roy. Somewhere within that time frame, Walt produced a follow-up series to Laphograms called Laughlets, which was even more short-lived than its predecessor. Unlike the Laphogram shorts, these were 20 to 30 seconds in length and they're nowhere to be found at all, thus remaining lost for the past 95 years. Because of this lack of preservation, very little is known about Laughlets, apart from four key facts. 1. The aforementioned average length of 20 to 30 seconds. 2. The series was comprised of 8 animated shorts. 3. The titles of these shorts, which are Golden Slow Motion, Desha's Tryst with the Moon, Aesthetic Camping, Ruben's Big Day, Rescued, A Star Pitcher, The Woodland Potter, and A Pirate for a Day. 4. The shorts were self-produced and released by Walt Disney alone. That's two strikes so far, Walter. I hope you have a better idea. For your sake. Actually, he does. During his time working on the Laphogram shorts, Walt had been working on a second project, a proverbial ace up his sleeve that would bring him to the light at the end of the proverbial tunnel. That project was known as Alice's Wonderland, a live-action animation hybrid centered on a girl living in a cartoon world and one of the earliest examples of its kind. Not to be confused with the 19th century children's novel by Lewis Carroll, the animated film adaptation to be released by Disney 29 years later, or any incarnation of the novel really. Walt then contacted New York film distributor Margaret Winkler in hopes of finding someone who will buy and showcase his work. Winkler wrote back to Walt on September of that year, requesting to see the Alice film reel. One month later, she contacted the Disney Brothers with a lucrative business proposition to produce six more Alice shorts under MJ Winkler Productions to the tune of $1,500 per short and to possibly produce an additional six more shorts should the initial quota be met and the venture successful. Thus, the Alice comedy series was born. Spanning 56 theatrical shorts, the series enjoyed a modest level of success and lasted over a three-year period. The success would eventually lead to Walt and Roy moving on to greener pastures at Universal Studios, where they and their longtime friend and partner in crime, Oop Ewerks, got hard at work to cook up the next big cartoon icon. And so we had Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. He didn't quite endear himself to the Universal execs, but he still proved to be an overnight animated wonder, going on to star in well over 190 shorts. This in turn led to him becoming the first Disney character to have his own merchandise produced in his name and likeness and chugged out like no other. Stuffed toys, candies, refrigerator magnets, t-shirts, just to name a few. Finally, after much hardship, after many dead ends, Walt's dream was now a reality. All is right with the world. Right? Right? Wrong.
It was the year 1928, and Walt found himself impeded by another roadblock. Around that time, he had approached the current head of Winkler Productions, Charles Mintz, who was also the husband to Margaret Winkler and had assumed control of her company following her retirement. Walt negotiated with Mintz a 20% increase in budget to produce the Oswald cartoons. The request was denied, and additionally, Mintz had forced Walt to take a 20% decrease in his budget. As a rub of salt on the wound, Mintz had persuaded a majority of Walt's animation team to resign and accept new jobs at a brand new studio that he had founded, a move that Mintz was more than proud to flaunt in his employees' face. What an asshole. As if things couldn't get any worse, Walt learned that he didn't own the rights to Oswald. Mintz used this fact to further his ultimatum. Either Walt cut his losses and continue production anyway, or have what measure of creative control remained wrested from his grasp and possibly face an untimely termination. Though technically, Mintz didn't own the rights to Oswald either, something that he himself hadn't realized at the time and would bite him in the butt later down the road. With the final Oswald short completed, Walt Roy and the remains of their animation team all packed their bags and left Winkler, Universal, and Mintz on bad terms. It kinda sucks but that's reality for you. It goes to show that you're not always a free man in the realm of creative media, and that your creation isn't always going to belong to you. To Walt's credit though, he did learn from his mistakes. From that point on, he swore to himself that the only person to be in charge of him was… well, him. Renewed in resolve, he and Ub went on to rebrand themselves as the company that would be known as the multimedia giant that it is today. And he once again buckled down to create the next big thing in cartoons, a phenomenon that would eclipse Oswald on a 100 to 1 scale. Thus, Mickey Mouse was born, and the animation world, nay, the entire world, would never be the same again.